So welcome to the second part or the final part of our inaugural symposium afternoon. We've had a fantastic uh, two lectures and I know we're not going to be disappointed with uh, the final of those lectures. So for those of you who don't know me, who've arrived uh, so in the middle of the afternoon, I'm Ros Smith. I'm the director of the UCL Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. And here we're celebrating the achievements of three of our new lecturers who, uh, perfect, it wasn't planned this way, I think the rail strike has contributed to it because Joe's lecture was moved, um, but we have one uh, professor of immunity, one professor of inflammation, and now Joe who's uh, a professor uh, and head of our section in the infection, inflammation and immunity department. So um, I'm going to introduce Joe, and as I said earlier, Mario Cortina Borgia will give the vote of thanks to Joe, and then without any hesitation or deviation, we will move seamlessly to the Winter Garden to have some uh, drinks of refreshment afterwards. So I won't announce that, I'll just expect you to head for the door and out onto the uh, Winter Garden. So uh, Professor Joe Standing, what can I say about you? Um, well, you're a pharmacist and therefore a member of a profession for whom I have, for which I have the greatest of respect. Um, Joe was born in Bradford uh, and I gather is a proud Yorkshireman and studied pharmacy in Manchester, graduating in 2001. And during his pre-registration uh, pharmacy year, uh, his rotation included Booth Hall uh, Children's Hospital, who many of us remember well as one of the two uh, children's hospitals in Manchester. And he arrived in uh, Great Ormond Street as a pharmacist in 2004, but it wasn't long before Joe was undertaking a PhD, uh, funded by Rosemont Pharmaceuticals, who were developing a new oral diclofenic uh, suspension. And at the time, uh, diclofenic was unlicensed for acute pain in children, and I have to say it's one of the major innovations in my career that, um, that pain relief such as diclofenic has been developed and used uh, to great benefit in children. So a huge therapeutic gap that has now been addressed. So much of Joe's work has addressed pharmacokinetics. So for those of you who are not pharmacists or medics, that's what the body does to the drug. And pharmacodynamics, which is what the drug does to the body, <coughs> and modeling these responses in different populations, which led him into the field of pharmacomimetics. So I'm not going to explain what that is. I'll leave that to you, Joe. Um, but this work uh, is, is fascinating, requires great uh, quantitative mathematical skills and insights. And so um, not undaunted, uh, Professor Standing uh, went and did a PG cert and then a master's in statistics at Birkbeck and UCL respectively. Uh, and it also led to him uh, being awarded an MRC methodology fellowship in 2011, uh, which was followed by an MRC clinician scientist fellowship in 2015, which meant that between 2011 and 2020, uh, Joe was continuously supported by MRC fellowships, which is a truly outstanding achievement. So uh, Joe has very successfully used these approaches to optimize antimicrobial therapy for children with infections and to optimize chemotherapy and immunosuppressive agents uh, in the treat treatment of children with hematopoietic stem cell transplants with obviously very important therapeutic benefit. What about the other aspects of Joe? Well, I've already alluded to how you can take the man out of Yorkshire, but you can't take Yorkshire out of the man. Um, and Joe is also a keen cyclist and once cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats in eight days. That's pretty impressive. And on a similar trip to Norway, he was stopped by a Norwegian news crew. And for those of you who want to learn more, there's a YouTube clip which I have viewed, but I'm not really much the wiser because it's in Norwegian. Uh, but uh, it shows some wonderful Nordic noir uh, landscapes um, uh, up in Norway. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we've got a treat in store, and please uh, join me in inviting uh, Joe Standing to deliver his inaugural lecture as a UCL professor the title of which is on the board. Thank you.
So thank you for the introduction. Is that better? There we go. Yeah. So we're going to go on a journey from the PDF from the periodic table to New Cambridge statistical tables. And we heard from Claire earlier on about South Yorkshire, but and the lack of famous people from South Yorkshire. Um, well, West Yorkshire is somewhat different. So this is the West Riding of Yorkshire. Um, it's about this, this um, area you're looking at is around 25 miles across, population of about 2 million people. And each of those black dots is the um, place where a Nobel Prize winner um, was either born or grew up. There's nine of them. You can only see eight dots, but amazingly, two of them were born in the small town of Todmorden. And these weren't Namby Pamby Nobel Prizes of peace or literature. <laughs> they, were <laughs> they were chemistry and mainly chemistry actually, in few physics and um, the odd physiology or medicine. But that's not to say that Yorkshire's not good at literature and the arts, of course, there's the greatest living artist of our time, David Hockney, uh, born in Bradford, Bronte sisters, J.B. Priestley, uh, Zayn Malik from One Direction, and of course, <laughs> Mel B. from the Spice Girls. Politics, Harold Wilson, the for those of you who don't know, probably the, the most important prime minister, if not post-war ever, the first prime minister to spend more on education than on war, set up all the new universities. His, his chancellor, Healy, was uh, born in Kent, but educated at Bradford Grammar School. And obviously, I have to mention sport. Bradford is the capital of cricket. Um, too many names to mention. Uh, Jim Laker, who obviously was England's greatest spinner and everyone thinks he was from Surrey, actually uh, grew up in Frising Hall and, and played for Saltaire, which is where I played for. Um, I've just given you two, um, two people from the current era. So we've got the biggest hitter in the current England team, Johnny Bairstow, and the biggest spinner of the ball in the current England cricket team, Adil Rashid. And of course, Yorkshire hits hard on the international stage in terms of the Olympics you know, finishing 12th in the table with people like Nicola Adams, Brownlee Brothers, etc. So now you're asking yourselves, why are so many great people and things coming out of such a small area? And could it be the air? Well, you may or may not know that Bradford is the respiratory, respiratory disease capital of um, England. It's the, the, the air valley and the Calder Valley um, are, are just sinks for pollution. Um, you know, the house that I grew up in has the, the water, the, the, you know, the, the stone is stained by the, the black soot that came from the factories in the, um, in, in the previous era. And, and these days, traffic pollution uh, hangs around there. So it's, it's, it's definitely not the air. Could it be the water? Well, the river colder, the river air near where I grew up, two of the most polluted rivers in the country, at least latterly maybe in the last 10 years they've cleaned up uh, largely because all the industry stopped but you know certainly where i used to play cricket as the river air goes over the weir at the derelict salts mill the you could see the foam on the river and um didn't stop people taking us in rowing boats on there but it was probably not the healthiest place so certainly not the water i think it's probably the teachers two of those nobel prize winners had the same teacher 20 years apart by the way and I had some great teachers. Um, so I started at uh, Shipley First School. And um, this is a proper Victorian building. So, um, you know, it's nice high ceilings to good ventilation for respiratory pathogens. You know, people of today could, could learn a lot building schools like this. We had a, even in the sort of 80s when I was there, there was an outside toilet 
although there was an indoor provision as well. And we had a really good teacher. One that I re remember most was Mrs. Bennett, who used to play the guitar to us um, in class in primary school. I then went on to Nabwood Middle School, which was a very good um, school. We had parapetetic music teachers. We could learn any instrument you want. This is the state school, so that's, um, you can just about see me in the middle. I played the trombone, and our aim was mainly to sort of drown out all the other people, the woodwind. And um, I played in uh, jazz orchestras, uh, played, played in the Bradford Youth Brass Band, led by Jim Shepard, who is the principal cornet of the Black Dyke Mills Band. He's the man who taught um, Ewan McGregor how to pretend to play the E-flat horn in the film Brassed Off. He was in it. And um, so we had brilliant music education and, of course, cricket. Um, I was a dour, fairly defensive batsman and first-change bowler. And then I went up to the, to the upper school, and it was, it was somewhat different. So this is architecture of the 1970s, and um, I got these pictures from the local paper um, because um, it was on the event of this school being demolished. Nabwa didn't even last 30 years, unfortunately, and it's, it's had, since I went there, it's, it's name changed several times. Uh, tellingly, the second picture from my era uh, features two police vans. Um, and whilst I don't remember there being police vans there every day, it's fair to say it was a, a school in decline while I was there, and of course, Helen didn't go there. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, I still had some brilliant teachers. And the one advantage of a lot of my contemporaries leaving school early at the age of 16 or earlier was that um, our A-level chemistry class, for example, had only eight people. Uh, in physics, we only had four people. And I had a brilliant teacher, Mrs. Williams, who was our chemistry teacher, who not only instilled in us a love of chemistry, but forced us all to read the periodic table by Primo Levi. And those of you that haven't read it, um, Primo Levi was an industrial chemist. And the periodic table is a biography of his life um, with chapters on each themed with a chemical element. And he talks about everything from understanding why a varnish that he was working on as an industrial chemist wouldn't work, to rock climbing, to his time at Auschwitz, because he was imprisoned there. So I managed to get up to the uh, University of Manchester, uh, and I chose pharmacy rather than chemistry as, you know, growing up in, in that er era, we were very keen to do something with a guaranteed job at the end. And, you know, pharmacy, especially in those days when there were only 16 schools of pharmacy, um, you had a guaranteed job. So I went to University of Manchester and had a bit of a shock. I'd um, originally wanted to study engineering, so I hadn't done A-level biology and really struggled in the physiology and cell biology and, and biochemistry. Um, and also, I was in the end of the first year hospitalized with, with peritonitis, with a, a burst appendix, nothing to do with the, the heavy drinking culture at Manchester, I'm sure. It was my first experience of intravenous antibiotics, by the way. Um, but then that shocked the system and failing those exams really um, made me develop a system for studying. And towards the end of the time, I, I started to do fairly well there, but I still didn't get interested in pharmacokinetics, despite the fact I was taught by Malcolm Rowland, who was the inventor of mathematical pharmacokinetics, I later realized, and Leon Ahrens, who was the pioneer of the population approach, which is essentially the, the techniques that we use in our research today. So, as I said, I did fairly well in my exams towards the end, and I was selected to, in my last summer to do a, um, a Royal Pharmaceutical Society scholarship, and I was allowed to choose any topic I wanted. And I chose chemistry, because I still love chemistry. And I worked with a very charismatic um, professor, Ian Stratford, and his postdoc, Jaff, who, and this is the paper that came out of our work, <laughs> several years, it was about five years after I worked on it, but we worked on novel indolquinones as bioreductive anti-cancer drugs. And I'll try and tell you why you've never heard of these. So I went into the lab and through uh, um, a combination of beginner's luck and youthful enthusiasm, I managed to do a nine-step synthesis without making any mistakes and had 300 milligrams of this end product um, which is very similar to this compound you see at the top, 
which was an indoquinone with a nitrogen mustard attached to it. And the whole idea behind these drugs was that on their own, they're inert. But when they come into hypoxic and oxygen deficit areas, like you might find in the middle of a tumor, the uh, nitrogen mustard opens, DNA alkylation, and it has specific anti-cancer therapy agents, uh, action. So the people in the lab were quite amazed that I'd managed to synthesize this compound and they took it into some cells and it was 300 fold more specific for hypoxic cells than normal cells. And that's when I started dreaming and thinking, well, who, who gets the Nobel Prize? Is it, is it Stratford? Does Jaff share it? Do I even get a look in? <laughs> and then the bubble was burst because people got so excited about this, they took it straight into mice and it killed all the mice because there are reductive environments everywhere in the body. And as biological systems get more complex, so new phenomena emerge that you didn't necessarily predict looking at individual things. And uh, around the same time, a, a, um, a group from Leiden took a compound called EO9 into breast cancer patients. And similarly, it was an analog of mitomycin C, but same idea should be activated within a, a solid tumor, caused massive toxicity and had absolutely no clinical benefit. So, and, and of course, this was the late 90s, early 2000s. We were hearing about the advent of biologics and you know, maybe even gene therapy on the horizon. So whilst I was offered a, a PhD studentship in medicinal chemistry, I decided to um, carry on my, with my pharmacy training. And I got a place at the Hope Hospital in Salford, the, the teaching hospital, which was quite um, difficult to get to because it was one of the better places to do your pre-reg year. But there was no pediatrics apart from a special care baby unit, which pharmacologically is a bit boring. It's just sedatives and analgesics. I hope there's no neonatologists here. Um, <laughs> but, um, oh yeah, so this is the thing. We, I realize more is different, you know. Um, physiological systems, the whole system isn't just merely applied molecular biology. So it was when I went to Booth Hall that I had an epiphany on a rotation. So I was walking around with the oncology pharmacist and she had a white coat on as, as they used to wear in those days. And the pockets were full of books. She had about three books in each pocket and a file of fax with lots of sheaves of paper. And I said, What's all, what, what do you need all this for? And she said, well, all these drugs, this is the dose of this one. This is the infusion rate of that one. And I said, well, why isn't it all in one place? And she said, well, none of these drugs are licensed for children. It's all, we've found some information here to give us this information on the infusion rate and so on. And I realized that children were being treated as second class citizens, that they were being denied evidence based medicine. Everything we learned about in the School of Pharmacy were the big cardiology trials, the randomized controlled trials that help old people, but children were, were not being treated properly. And there was some talk at the time, they didn't really matter. I remember um, David Taylor at the School of Pharmacy was doing a, a, a policy report and he said, well, does it all matter about unlicensed medicines in children? They, they're probably getting on all right, aren't they? They're not. This was um, a paper from Nottoman, who's um, an infectious diseases doctor who was wondering why um, these kids that he was treating with tubercular meningitis weren't getting better. And um, he realized that the, they couldn't swallow the whole tablet. So either the tablets were being crushed up and mixed with apple sauce, or the intravenous liquid was mixed with apple juice because it tasted so horrible and um, given to the children. And as you can see, the pharmacokinetic curves mean you get half to a, a quarter of the exposure when you mess about with the formulation like that. I was a resident pharmacist at Great Ormond Street and on a fairly daily basis, we were encountering these problems of unlicensed medicines. And it was whilst on call, so on calls, resident pharmacy, you do a lot of um, you know, preparing a TPN and getting, doing some TTOs, but occasionally you're asked for your opinion on something, which is really nice. Um, and one time I was asked my opinion on a, a Sunday evening by a very worried um, registrar who had just found out that a child on the ward had been given a thousand fold overdose of clonidine 
milli it's been dosed in milligrams rather than micrograms. And the reason for this is that clonidine is unlicensed in children and there's only adult strength vials. And the child was lethargic and hypotensive and they wanted to know what to do about it. And this is one of the papers I found. And um, funnily enough, uh, Perani Longfist is a, um, an anesthetist at the Karolinska who I now work with. But he, he produced this beautifully simple paper on the relationship between clonidine pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And what we could see is actually that the um, hypotensive effect is saturable. So actually, even if you give a really big dose, it didn't matter too much. But the, pro the other problem was that clonidine's got a very long half-life, so it stays in the body a long time. So we could put some numbers into these equations and say, well, probably the child's going to be okay, um, but we're going to have to wait 16 to 20 hours to find out. And in fact, the, the child did make a full recovery. And if you look in the literature, there are, there are probably about almost 10 uh, case reports of this happening in other children. It's, it's not a, at all a rare thing. And this is a direct consequence of children having unlicensed medicines. So this was the big research question. How can we ensure that children receive evidence-based medicine? And it was while I was working as a resident pharmacist that um, Ian Wong uh, set up the Center for Pediatric Pharmacy Research. And we realized that we need at least PKPD information to get these mathematical relationships and also to understand safety if we can't get the big randomized control trial data. And Ian was a brilliant supervisor in many ways um, because, or for me was, because he mainly supported me but left me alone. He was an epidemiologist and much more interested in drug safety. But as soon as he realized that my main interest was in PKPD, rather than trying to push my PhD towards what he was interested in, he gave me the freedom to do what I was interested in. And he introduced me to people like Trevor Johnson and Hussein Muller, who were pediatric pharmacists who'd done the same thing as me. He introduced me to Brian Anderson, an anesthetist in, in Auckland, who helped me to learn non-mem. And that sort of support was um, absolutely fantastic during my PhD. And I actually ran two clinical trials. There was a, a big safety study with uh, 300 patients in. Uh, and we also ran um, a clinical pharmacokinetic study and again, I think this is beginner's luck and led me to think that clinical trials were easy because um, we just approached children who were coming for, for an operation and we said to them, look, you're going to get diclofenac anyway. The reason we were studying diclofenac, by the way, is it was the most used uh, unlicensed medicine um, in the hospital. Why don't we give you this new formulation while you're asleep in the operating theater? We'll take a couple of blood samples. So you can see that we approached 96 children and 74 of them said yes. There were three naughty ones who spat the dose out. <laughs> but I watched, you know, because it was my PhD was on the line here. So I watched them and I, <laughs> they were out, <laughs> not taking any blood from you. Um, but the rest, you know, swallowed the dose hole and we got some uh, very nice pharmacokinetics, which we merged together with some healthy volunteer pharmacokinetics. Um, which was very rich sampling in adults. And I fitted this model, and you don't need to know what, what it is, but what you do need to see is it, it's unnecessarily complicated. If this, this paper has actually been cited around 15 or 16 times. And when preparing for this lecture, I, um, I look back at all the papers that have cited it. And no one has used such a complicated model to describe diclofenac pharmacokinetics since. I've never used this very complicated model since. But in making this model and in tinkering with non-men and reading and trying to understand all the problems, it really helped me to learn. And um, Ian also supported me to do pharmacogenomics, even though we were completely underpowered. We, um, I went to uh, University of Helsinki and uh, with Joanna Sistanen, one of the PhD students there, we, we genotyped the patients for CYP2C9. We didn't find any homozygous poor metabolizers, so there was no real significant thing in terms of PK. But really in my PhD, I got to explore a lot of things and, and really enjoyed this idea of not just pharmacokinetics, but the population approach to pharmacokinetics where we didn't have to take 
tens of samples from each child, but we could get big numbers. So it was in presenting my work from my PhD that at the PAGE meeting that I met uh, Max Carlson, who was chairing the session, and he mentioned to me that there was some funding to go and work on the pediatric program of Maraviroc, which was a Pfizer antiretroviral. Um, so I went to Sweden um, and I didn't see any pediatric Maraviroc data. And this, cause, this was because <laughs> the trial took so long to recruit. So, but it gave me time to do lots of side projects. We had this really nice paper with some anesthetists in Stanford where we characterized the remifentanil PKPD relationship. I didn't set foot in a hospital apart from to attend the birth of Lucas or a couple of days after Lucas was born because uh, the group was mainly um, you know, focusing on industry collaborations. But I really learned a lot on PKPD, came back to London and really well supported again by Ian and uh, Judith Cope, the chief pharmacist. They cobbled together a year's worth of funding um, because then the Maravrock data was coming, so we got a little bit more money from Pfizer as well. And I could write the fellowship application. And what I realized is that um, my mathematical training was deficient. So I wrote this um, MRC methodology fellowship, and this is where we get to New Cambridge statistical tables. We've gone from chemistry to statistics. And what Robin and um, Mario uh, advised me was that on these kind of fellowships, you really need to make the training element look really serious. So I said, well, I'll, I'll do a, an MSc in statistics at the UCL Department of Statistics, which by the way, was the first ever you know, university that had a separate statistics department, you know, Pearson, um, all these famous statisticians came out of UCL. And so I got the fellowship and um, went to the stats department and said, you know, sign me up for next year. And they said, well, give us your CV. And they said, you're not coming. You haven't done enough maths. You, you don't know enough basic stats. Um, so I had to go to night school um, to Birkbeck College to do maths and stats. And to give you some context, Daniel was born on the 10th of April. And my first exam was on the 10th of May, I think. Um, that's after a year of getting off the train at 11 o'clock at night, twice a week. But I got through it all with the help of people like Mario, Robin, and um, especially with the help of Nigel, helping me to understand how to present my research. And the bottom right um, picture I want to show you is that when you start your own group, then you start getting these, um, what I like to call my small potatoes, the, the, the people who actually do all the work. And they're the people I'll focus the rest of the talk on. So this is one of our first ever group meetings with them. Um, we've got Jake Morris, who was a, a stats undergraduate. Eva was here as a Erasmus at the time. She became one of my first PhD students. And then we've got Joanna, who's a complex PhD student of, of Robin and Nigel's, who's interested in nonlinear mixed effects modeling and uh, El Hammer, who's a School of Pharmacy PhD student. So that's the introduction. I'm now gonna tell you a few little bits about the research I've done over the last, uh, when I say I, I mean they've done, and my name's been at the end of the papers over the last few years, and then briefly touch on some future directions. So when I started working in pediatrics, we had, in, in, in pediatric pharmacology, you had this statement, children are not small adults. But then a few years later, we got this other statement, children are small adults. Now, both of these statements, obviously they, they seem to contradict each other, don't they? But they're both true because they were written in peer reviewed medical journals. <laughs> but <laughs> the point is up until the late 90s, <laughs> until anyone bothered to think about pediatric pharmacology. Children are not small adults was a stamp collecting exercise. There were just lists of differences without telling you what the significance of those potential differences or similarities were. And actually what we realize is we need to understand that you don't turn 18 or 16 or 12 and become completely different. And maturation, of course, is a continuous process. And we need to understand that. So, oh, by the way, um, whilst children are not small adults, um, it turns out that pediatricians are small doctors. 
Um, I don't know if you've seen that. So, <laughs> but, you know, we like to think of children are small adults and we need to understand how things scale. And so that's what one of the first things that Eva did in her PhD. She compared all these different mathematical formulas for scaling and showed that this standardized method gave a pretty good um, description. And then Dagan on the right. So Dagan's um, an interesting fellow. He, he's, um, he's a clinical pharmacologist and um, an intensive care doctor. And he came to me and said um, he wants to do his PhD on um, the pharmacokinetics of 10 antibiotics. He set out the assays in, in the intensive care. And he showed me his protocol and he said, and in the protocol it said, inclusion criteria, age 18 years and above. So I said, well, I'm not, why have you excluded children? Children need antibiotics. Children have intensive care, you know. So to his credit, <clears throat> he extended the inclusion criteria. So he recruited to the same protocol, albeit with fewer samples in the smaller babies. He recruited patients on the neonatal, pediatric and adult ICUs at, at St. George's. His youngest patient was a 24 week old preterm baby in its first week of life. And his oldest patient was 90 years. And by doing that with lots of different renally cleared antibiotics, he was able to derive a mathematical function that takes you from birth to death. So we understand how things scale. And once we understood how things scale, future students came along and published lots of papers on pharmacokinetics of various agents using these scaling methods. We extended um, this to how does pharmacodynamic scale, in particular in immunology. So with, with Robin and uh, Rollo Hoare, we understood that um, if we look at the biology of T cells and thymic output, how it changes with age, how key 67 expression changes with age, so we can understand how the turnover of, of these cells um, changes with age. We can predict how T cell dynamics change with age and B cell dynamics change with age. And from that, we can predict the drug effects. So for example, for T cells, we could show um, the antiretroviral effects where you've got um, a drug effect on against a virus or the direct effect of, for example, rituximab on B cells, all using um, understanding, theoretical understanding of how things scale with age. So the next thing I want to talk about is antimicrobials. So for many years, I was the antimicrobial pharmacist at GOSH. And, you know, going back to Philip Anderson and more is different and the importance of studying the whole system. I think for a number of years, I discounted too much what we can learn in vitro. And I was really focused on only doing clinical trials. And this is the result from the Neomero trial. And you can see it was published in 2018. And we wrote the grant for this in 2009. So it took us nine years to recruit 24 patients who happened to have a gram negative bloodstream infection that we could get a minimum inhibitory concentration for, that we could get pharmacokinetics for, that we could then work out PKPD relationships. So, um, and it was confounded by how sick the patients were. So we can do a lot with clinical trials, but you do have to go back to the lab. And, and so we, we managed to get some funding from the NIHR to set up the hollow fiber infection model, which um, Najla, who's uh, one of my PhD students, along with John Redman, who's the postdoc who leads the lab, um, have recently shown that with this hollow fiber infection model, so we can grow organisms in a capsule with how we set the rates of the pumps, we can let the antibiotic concentrations go up and down, just like they would in the body. And we've recently shown that we can replicate certain mouse studies in the lab, and we don't have to use animals to work out the PKPD index. So finally, I'd like to talk about data science and our initiative on pkpdai.com. So, a few years ago, when we heard about the hype of uh, machine learning. So these days, everything is machine learning, um, you know, artificial intelligence. When I was doing my PhD, and one of the reasons we did pharmacogenomics is because you had to do pharmacogenomics for everything. And if you found out the genotype, that would describe everything. And of course, it doesn't. You know, it was just hype. And that now we understand pharmacogenomics has its place and understand, can help understand some of the variability. So I thought before diving into... Um, just applying machine learning to everything. We should, we should speak to some experts. 
one of whom was Watty that we work with now over at UCL Computer Science. And one of the really exciting things that Watty told me about was natural language processing, whereby we can extract information from text. Pharmacokinetics is a fairly new discipline. Malcolm Rowland kind of invented it in the 60s. But these days, if you type pharmacokinetics into PubMed, you get 600,000 hits. You can't read all of those papers, but you can send an algorithm to look at those papers and extract the relevant piece of information, the AUC, the um, half-life, the species that it was um, studied in, the number of patients. Um, we're also doing a lot of data science work in terms of looking at electronic health records and how we can leverage routinely collected data to help us get a head start on that. So uh, with a, this infection, so I have to finish by talking about COVID. So this is how we do um, drug development. It's drug development consists of cycles of learning and confirming. So you, you learn a drug has an effect in vitro, you might try it in animals, and then you learn again in early phase studies, and then you finally confirm things in a phase three study. And the UK has taken a, a completely different approach to any um, pharmaceutical company. Um, and you know, it's, it, for me, it's rather odd. So the big platform trials, the recovery trial and the principal trial took, at least for antivirals, questionable agents, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, uh, lopinavir, straight to phase three without checking whether they could interrupt the viral load. Okay, and uh, no drug company ever does this, but if, if you're bankrolled by the government, um, it seems you can. The only metric of success of these trials, by the way, is, is number of patients. You know, recovery trials got 50,000 patients in it. What's it found in terms of antivirals? Not a lot. So what we did was we, at Graham Street, we realized early on that, um, you know, the, the pandemic wasn't going to hit children too badly. So when we thought, what contribution can we make? We, we um, wrote the, the FLARE trial, which was a combination of favipiravir, an influenza drug from Japan that we've used a bit at Great Ormond Street, with a protease inhibitor called lopinavir, which um, has got some modest anti-SARS-CoV-2 effect, but we knew it wouldn't be good enough on its own. And so we did a phase two trial. We did a, it was a factorial design. So some people got two placebos, some people got one drug, one, and some people got both drugs. And people said it's impossible to do placebo control trials, but after, being denied funding in the first round. We got funded from LIFARC in, uh, I think it was late April, early May, 2020. By September, we opened the trial. It's perfectly possible to turn around. The, the lopinavir placebos were made by a company, a, a pharmacist that's spun out a company um, in North London. And he machined um, match placebos for lopinavir within, within six weeks. We were denied urgent public health badging because we weren't recruiting millions of patients. We, because, because for a well-designed phase two trial, of course, you only need 60 patients per arm, 240 patients, um, which meant we're actually blocked from recruiting from um, any centers. There was 10 other centers that wanted to recruit to the trial and, and we were blocked from that. But we did, ma we did manage to get to the sample size from um, Royal Free only um, in a year. And what we found is that favipiravir on its own does have a modest antiviral effect, although the, the drop in viral load is clearly not enough for clinical significance on its own. The combination was worse than favipiravir alone, okay? And if we'd been one of these platform trials, we wouldn't know why. But of course, we were a phase two trial who does pharmacokinetics. We learn from our trials. And what we have discovered, which pharmacologically is interesting, is a new drug-drug interaction. So the favipiravir levels were actually lower in the combination arm, which actually had a worse effect. But you know, if, if we'd taken this approach and this approach had been backed, with a thousand patients, you could have ruled in or out eight drugs and their two by two combinations, and you could have done it very quickly. People are starting to see sense on this, by the way. So on the back of the, us running the FLARE trial, we've been funded um, to do more mathematical modeling. So ACOSA is doing that um, you know, to understand viral dynamics and the drug effects. And we've also been invited to, be, to run the virology sub-study 
of the UK National Platform Trial, Panoramic. So we've got um, 600 patients worth of samples that have been kindly processed by uh, Jim and his team at, in the GOSH labs. Um, so hopefully soon we'll, we'll see whether Molnupiravir really works or not. And um, we're going to start recruiting to Paxlovid very soon. So that's the research I've been doing in the last sort of decade and a bit. Um, just want to go into the future perspectives now. So drug development is still not working for children. This is a fairly recent paper, two years old, and still in Europe, only 14% of new drugs that come to market are licensed in children when they come to market. If you look at neonates, that's only 4%. It's maybe understanding that when a drug first comes to market, it's not licensed in children. But on the other side, over the next 12 years, only a quarter of drugs ever get licensed for children. And so we've got drugs like posaconazole that um, Austin's team you know, uses like water in, on, the, on the wards. It's now off patent and it's still not licensed in, in under 12s. We can't do trials, obviously, or we, we can do trials, and we, we're supporting trials. Actually, yesterday we found out we got an MRC DPFS award to, to develop a new drug with some collaborators at King's, uh, Edwards, and, and colleagues that were mentioned earlier um, for a new drug for neolateral asphyxia. But we're going to have to leverage other ways of, of looking at um, a data. And one thing we've got a brilliant resource here is the data lake, the electronic health records from the patients at GOSH which we've um, already leveraged to do a lot of uh, interesting studies. And I think we've just hit the tip of the iceberg on, on what's possible from this side. Antimicrobial resistance infections, is still a big problem. Uh, you know, multi-resistant gram negatives could uh, undermine most services that we want to deliver at GOSH. So um, understanding how we can combat uh, resistant organisms is, is going to be a really important part of, of the next 10 to 15 years of worth of research. So I just end with some acknowledgements. We've been lucky enough to get funding from the major funders and, and you know, kept in, in work for now. And also to um, correct a, a slight mistake, because of course, um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my family. Um, you know, when you've got a, a professor, a, um, you know, a, a, a university lecturer, and the man who discovered the potassium sparing effects of a milleride in his PhD, um, you know, you, you, can't, you can't fail to fail. And especially when you've got an understanding wife and you know, three wonderful kids. So thank you for your attention. Joel, oh, thank you very much. That was brilliant. And uh, I, 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 let me put my slides first. Last time I was here, I broke the mouse. I hope it will be at least. Um, right, well, um, first of all, Joe, many congratulations. That was brilliant, really very well done. And of course, congratulations on your whole career. It's an example uh, as a scientist uh, of, of what one should do, I, I, if I may say that. It's a great privilege for me to be invited to, to close down uh, Joe's inaugural. And I, I have to, to declare that I share a, at least three things with Joe. The first one is that we have an enthusiasm for checkered shirts. I have never seen, oh, probably a couple of times with striped shirts, but most of the time, like me, he wears checkered shirts, like most statisticians. Um, the second one, of course, is an enthusiasm for R. For those of you that do not, don't know R, R is not a language or a computing language, it's a way of life, and Joe and I share that, that way of life. Like, and thirdly, uh, the enthusiasm and the, the appreciation for Harold Wilson, especially these days, uh, I won't say anything about prime ministers, but especially these days, Wilson's stature looks bigger than ever, and I'll go back to Wilson in a moment. Um, I first worked with Joe, as you can see, nine years ago, ten years ago, when he came to me about his MSc thesis in the Stats Department in UCL. Uh, a very unusual student, he already had a PhD, and it was obvious that he was already a very good 
scientist. So it was very easy to supervise him, just you know, say yes, yes to whatever he said. And um, the title, as you can see, is not exactly uh, enticing, but it's, it's, a, it's a nice problem, and Joe did it brilliantly. Um, this is a graph from the thesis, uh, just to show uh, how much visualizations have moved in the last nine years. And uh, I won't go into the technical details of what this is, but that, that's part of Joe's thesis. Um, that's a uh, word cloud that I prepared today with Joe's uh, title. So that's all his, his um, peer-reviewed papers condensed into one word cloud. You can see pharmacokinetics, of course, very much at the center of, of the cloud, but also model children cell. And I think it's a good portrait of, of what Joe's research is about. Um, it's, it, 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 um, you know, that, that's, I think, what, what happens in his, in his uh, papers very much. Um, I really very much like the way in which Joe structured his, his lecture, moving from his own origins in uh, God's own county and so on, uh, talk, touching about Primo Levi, brilliant book of the periodic table, of course, and ending up after a very good overview of his research and future plans uh, with his family. So I would like to, to try to follow that path uh, with that. Of course, you can see that and um, after a glimpse of the future, Joe ended up with his family and the, uh, this is the part of the thesis that I want to, to share with you. Um, only Daniel there, but clearly a uh, uh, love from his family that he already mentioned at the end of the talk. And a nice quote by George Box, uh, a very eminent statistician, all models are wrong, some are useful. Yes, two right as we know, statistician and scientist. That's very much the core, I think, of Joe's work uh, is it's to, to, to be useful, to, to, to do something that works and that actually uh, produces evidence base for treating children uh, properly medically. Well, um, that's me. You will be uh, glad to know that there are some refreshments outside and we have had three very good inaugural lectures, Claire and Spina and Joe. And it's a pleasure just to invite you to, to have some uh, nibbles and uh, drinks in the gallery. So I have to read this because otherwise I would make a mess of things. But uh, you will remember that Joe mentioned uh, Harold Wilson in his talk. And um, Wilson, uh, if you don't know, he was a very eminent statistician. He was president of the Royal Statistical Society and prime minister, of course, who was born in Gozo on county's best district, as, as Joe was. And um, he maintained Harold Wilson. Sorry, I'm going to, uh, as you know, statisticians don't do jokes, but I'm going to attempt a joke and see what happens. So Wilson was prime minister, and at the same, a, bit, a bit after that, he was a president of the Royal Statistical Society, and he maintained, and I, I believe this is true, that uh, the moment he couldn't say in one go, I am the president of the Royal Statistical Society, he knew that it was time to stop drinking wine. So do please enjoy the wine and heed his lordship's uh, advice. Thanks very much, and thanks to Joe, Claire, and Spina. Thank you.